Hello there. Oh dear, more costs for electric vehicle owners. This net zero lark is not as cheap as they'd have you believe. Oh, and there's more news on Sadiq Khan and his ULEZ expansion scheme as well. Not only will electric vehicle drivers face paying more tax and be charged by the mile to drive with cameras snooping inside their cars to check how many passengers they've got, their insurance costs will also go up. Yes, it turns out that EVs, or more accurately, battery electric vehicles or BEVs, cost more to recover and repair and are more likely to be written off completely than the traditional internal combustion engine or ice-driven cars. A government-funded investigation by Thatcham Research shows that BEV claims are already 25.5% more expensive than their ICE equivalents and take 14% longer to repair. And this is before EVs become the overwhelming majority of cars on the road. And one suspects the government will try some legislative sleight of hand to shift some or all of that extra cost onto the drivers of petrol and diesel cars in order to keep the electric vehicle proposition attractive to buyers. Until it's too late, of course, when there are no longer any ICE cars left to insure and the extra cost slams into BEV owners. Anyway, the Department for Transport published a document in January last year called Recovery Operators – working with electric vehicles. And in that document, it lays down how cars with electric powertrains called XEVs should be treated after an accident. XEVs covering hybrids and battery-only driven vehicles. And it's quite a lot more onerous than dealing with a petrol or diesel car, because the slightest damage to the battery or battery compartment can lead to a catastrophic fire destroying the vehicle, everything in it and everything within a few feet of it, causing the fire to spread rapidly. And there's lots of examples of this on social media. And one takeaway from these instructions is that if the vehicle is damaged, do not touch it with bare hands. Think about someone, possibly a child, trapped in that car and you on the outside being unable to even to try to open the door without potentially electrocuting yourself in the process because you haven't got high voltage gloves on hand. And how about this? It is not recommended to tow XEVs on their wheels because this can cause electrical power to be generated, which can cause damage to the high voltage systems. And it goes on to say that many manufacturers are saying only flatbed trucks should be used for recovery. So no more tow trucks, it seems. But you can tow or push an electric vehicle a minimum distance at no more than walking pace as long as the brake is disengaged and the vehicle is in neutral. But importantly, only if the vehicle has not been involved in a road traffic collision and is not visibly damaged. So even a slight bit of damage might mean the vehicle is left blocking the road for some considerable time. And if the car is damaged, recovery should only be conducted when the emergency services are in attendance. And then it goes into the chemical and battery thermal runaway scenarios, where the advice is for us to, uh, well, run away. But when all that's dealt with and the recovery has taken place and the road is once again clear, any damaged EV ends up in a recovery compound where it has to be stored at least 15 metres away from other vehicles until it's been inspected for safety or the battery has been removed. And that takes up oodles of extra space, unless the compound has separate fire-resistant cubicles for each vehicle, an equally expensive option. On top of that, Monitor XEVs which pose a fire risk for up to 48 hours after an incident, 
If the HV battery temperature does not drop to ambient temperatures, then leave the vehicle in a safe quarantine location. All of the above adds to the insurance costs, as well as making it sound like we would be driving around with sticks of gelignite stuck to the chassis. And as I said, so far the costs have been about 25% higher and the repairs take 14% longer and the smallest amount of damage to the battery or the battery compartment can lead to the whole thing being written off completely. And can you imagine the impact of a major tail-end pile-up on a motorway? How many days would that take to clear? I also don't think it will be long before no EV will be able to be sold second-hand unless it's had a government-approved inspection paid for by the purchaser prior to sale. A test to check both battery safety and performance. Because the layman's once over from a purchaser and a quick test drive might not show that the car has a potentially fatal flaw. Maybe that's a law that should be brought in sooner rather than later before someone does buy a second-hand death trap. I mean, would you buy a used EV that someone had possibly curbed the week before and scraped the battery compartment? Remember that to keep the centre of gravity as low as possible, the battery compartment of an EV is as near to the road as the designer can safely get it. And this is just the start of the electric vehicle dream. And now to Sadiq Khan, the Labour Party London Mayor, and his money-grabbing ultra-low emission zone expansion scheme. Soon, as we know, to be morphed into a pay-per-mile scam. Because Khan has a couple of new critics in town, critics who say it's right to raise concerns about this ULES expansion. And one of these critics is none other than Khan's Labour Party leader, Keir Starmer. Not only that, Danny Beals, the Labour Party's own candidate in the Uxbridge and Ryslip by-election, forced by the shock resignation of Boris Johnson, has also raised concerns about the ULES expansion. In response to questioning over this, Starmer said, Danny Beals is our candidate in Uxbridge, a very good candidate too and he is rightly raising concern on behalf of what he hopes will be his constituents in relation to ULES, because we all understand the impact it has financially. I translate that to mean Labour has been taking a battering on the doorsteps in London over Khan's plans. So the party's leadership needs to say something to placate their worries to get votes, when what they should be doing is being honest and telling people they're pushing on with the ULES expansion regardless, because that's exactly what they will do once the election is over, be in no doubt. And Starmer quickly climbed back on his fence by refusing to say whether he backs Khan or Beals on this matter. But be in no doubt, if elected, once the dust has settled, for Labour it will be back to the drive for net zero and fully backing the ULES expansion. This is just the usual hypocritical, mealy-mouthed politicking by Labour. This year Starmer is backing Beals for Uxbridge and next year he'll be backing Khan for London after the ULES expansion has come into force. Unless the current challenge by five local Tory councils bears some fruit. <laughs>